A good morning to you all. And welcome to the Business of Farming webinar series brought to you by the Agribusiness Online TV. And today's discussion is on egg production business. My name is Rollins and I'm with Agribusiness Media under which you find the Agribusiness Magazine, a monthly publication, and also where you find the Agribusiness Directory, which is an annual digital publication whose forward was done by Dr. Basera, and Agribusiness Talk. Those are our, those are our social media platforms. And this online TV hosting these weekly webinars. So, We'll share links in the chat section to our free publications and also platforms that we believe you farmers can benefit from. So if you are looking for information on the business of egg production, you are in the right place. We are also going live on our, on our um, Facebook page, that's Agribusiness Media, and also on our YouTube channel. So the webinar is brought to you by Agribusiness Online TV. We'll also share a link to our YouTube channel and we encourage you to subscribe. The reason why we are doing this webinar is we believe that egg production can be exciting and can be a profitable enterprise. And as a business venture, the success and profitability really depends on several major factors. And these include proper cultural practices, a dependable source of uh, health stock, that's your point of lay or your uh, chicks, a balanced nutrition program, dependable infrastructure or housing, and also sound financial management practices, and more importantly, a good marketing strategy. So this webinar will give experts an opportunity to share their knowledge covering uh, their knowledge, expertise, and covering these key success factors. So we do hope that uh, such knowledge will help in the migration from subsistence to commercial farming. So how this webinar is going to unfold is we are going to have an informative discussion with great presentations from the experts from the industry and also representatives from key stakeholders in the egg value chain. So today, we have Dr. Mario Befa is with the Livestock and Meat Advisory Council in the, in the uh, Zimbabwe Poultry Producers Association. We also have Tamari Mthanga. She's with the Agribusiness Division of the uh, People's Own Savings Bank, uh, POSB. Then we have Obey Mashinga. She's, uh, he is with uh, National Foods. And we also have Dr. Garikai Marutsi is with profits. So no doubt that we have experts uh, today. So we know that you farmers and participants, you will have questions. So we will give everyone who is joining today an opportunity or a chance to ask you questions. And this has been built in our today's uh, program. So to allow for a smooth transition that's between the presenters. We have a question and answer section right at the end or after all presenters. So if you have a question, please type in the chat. Or if you are watching us live on Facebook, uh, please type in the comment section. Uh, then we will attend to the questions uh, later on. So we do have excellence experts today who will attend to your questions. So we believe that sustainable egg production is market driven. So with that belief, let's start off our presentations today with uh, Dr. Befa, as he will cover the local production and uh, market trends or consumption trends, uh, Dr. Befa. Or maybe you can also uh, do a brief introduction before the presentation. Good morning, Rawlings. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, good morning to all the participants. Uh, and uh, and uh, let me take this uh, opportunity to thank Agribusiness for putting this together. Um, 
I'm going to try and share my screen. Thank you very much and apologies for the little break. Um, so my name is uh, Mario Beffa. I am part of the Secretariat of the Livestock and Meat Advisory Council, uh, which is uh, an, over, uh, an overarching entity looking into the affairs of or representing the affairs of many representatives in the livestock industry. Uh, we have many members in the LMAC and one of our members is the Zimbabwe Poultry Association who we provide the secretariat for. So uh, we, we, I will give you a, a brief overview on local production and consumption trends. So firstly, who is the ZPA? ZPA is, is a, a producer association that is open to all interested in poultry production. We have an elected council. Our current chairman is Mr. Solomon Zawi. The council meets regularly, discusses all the issues affecting industry and champions these issues. Um, one of the other jobs we do is we collect, collate, analyze uh, industry data and present reports. And that will be the major uh, output of my discussion today is what we, a summary of all the, the information we have collected. Uh, as I indicated, the, the ZPA is a member of the Livestock and Meat Advisory Council. Uh, we have a secretariat under the LMAC and we provide uh, services to a number of associations, including stock feeds, the pig industry, uh, the chicken, um, the uh, rabbits are, are our members, uh, dairy are a member. We also have the Abattoirs Association uh, under us. So we have a wide spectrum of members under the LMAC. From the ZPA point of view, uh, one of the things we do do is collect monthly returns from most of the breeders in the country and most of the hatcheries. Uh, so we, we have information on how many birds they've got on the ground, how many eggs they're producing, how many chicks they're producing. We also have uh, some producers who are giving us returns and we have quite a lot of the large abattoirs sending us returns. So from these returns, we have an understanding of what's happening in the industry. And from these, uh, a big important thing is we estimate what is happening in the small and medium sector, uh, which is large. We estimate the, uh, the broiler accounts for two thirds of total production and the table egg accounts for half of total production. So we, and we base our estimates on the number of chicks going into those sectors. Uh, we build in a lot of formulas and we estimate. So as you can see, we have good information on a third of the broiler industry and half of the egg industry. The other remaining part is some guesswork. And we are putting in uh, structures to try and improve the, the capturing of data from those sectors to reduce the amount of uh, guesswork. So I'll go straight away into some of our uh, production. Uh, records and I'm sorry some of my screen has been hidden here. So this is our layer breeders. So I'm showing a graph here of layer breeders from January 2015 to December 2020. Uh, so in the bottom of the, of the axis we're going from January to December and on the uh, left side is the number of birds in thousands and you can see we're going from zero to 80,000. The green line at the bottom there, which is hovering around the 20,000 line, is your young growing chicks. And you can see there's been quite a lot of movement up and down. And the big thing to point out is this, uh, your avian influenza in the middle of the chart here, October 2017. Very, very big hit. Um, the blue line is the broiler breeders in lay. These are the birds that are producing the hatching eggs that will go into the hatcheries uh, from which we will get the sex bullets. 
And you can see from January 2015 um, to uh, just before the, the COVID, not the COVID, the avian influenza, this, this October, uh, this, this, it was actually May, May 2017. Uh, you can see that the line was softening. Okay, we went from about 30, 30,000 and we were going into about the 25,000. Okay, so the yellow line is adding the two and gives us an overall in, a reflection of the investment in the breeding industry. So as, as I pointed out from the beginning, you can see a softening uh, and we'll discuss that just now. Um, so we went from about 50,000, uh, yeah, we, we hovered around 50,000. And then avian influenza. And you can see the dramatic impact AI had uh, in the industry. So we were very unlucky to get AI in this country in one hand. On the other hand, we were very lucky that it hit the largest and most um, organized uh, sector and that was Urban's uh, who were able to deal with this, but it came at a price. And you can see we lost half our stocks. We went from 50,000, more than half our stocks to less than 20,000. And the other interesting thing is you can see it took us a long time. It took us over a year to rebuild our breeding stocks. And what was really interesting is then the post AI, we saw a dramatic growth going right up to, to the late 2019, you started to see a lot of uh, hiccups, okay? We started going into some serious focus. And then you had another wobble in uh, early 2020, your COVID lockdown, which again, uh, came on the back of, we saw a lot of breeders having a massive rethink. But right now, at the end of 2020, the industry is the strongest it's been uh, since January 2015. So to, to look at just the layer breeders year on year, just to give you a feel for what's happening. So these are the breeders in production. Again, uh, so we're going from January to December and we're showing all the different years and we're going from 10,000 birds to 60,000 birds. So 2015, uh, you can see we were hovering around 30,000. 2016, we started off okay and we saw some disinvestment coming in. 2017, you can see the midway and then you can see the huge impact of avian influenza. And you can see the slow recovery to the end of 20, uh, 2017. 2018, you can see continued recovery, phenomenal growth that year. 2019, continued growth, and then we saw some economic stability and people doing a rethink. And this is where we're at the red line at the top is 2020. The industry is as strong as it's ever been. So these are good indications going into 2021. So if we look, I believe this is hatching eggs. Again, I can't see the top of my screen. So these are hatching eggs going into the industry uh, from 2015 to 2020. And we're going from 200,000 uh, eggs. Sorry, can, can, uh, can I see the top of my screen here? I hope I'm talking layer hatching eggs, yes. Um, apologies. Uh, so this is layer hatching eggs. And again, you can see in 2015, uh, the hatching eggs going into the hatchery were uh, relatively strong in the 800,000 line. And then we started towards the end of 2015, see some disinvestment. And you can see the, the graph went down in 2016, the blue line. 2017, it was also soft. And then we saw the huge impact of avian influenza and the recovery has been slow. You can see we started recovering there, 2018, this, this green line, 
and you can see we still we had recovered by the end of 2018, but it took us a year to recover. 2019 started seeing some growth, and again you started to see this fall off against the economic instability. 2020 has been relatively strong throughout the year. We did see a bit of a hiccup in the middle, April, May, with the COVID restrictions. So these are the hatching eggs that go into the hatcheries, okay? And these are the sexed pullets. So remember, of all the eggs that are going in, only half will be female. So these are the sexed pullets coming out of the hatchery. Um, again, January to December, going from 50,000 to 350,000. And you can see in 2015, it was very strong. We were, we were sitting on 300,000 for several months, okay? Compared to a long-term average around 200,000. So we saw a massive growth, a 50% growth of uptake of day-old chicks. And all of this uptake was in the smallholder sector. And as we'll come along and see later on, uh, a lot of you who have been in table eggs will know uh, we then started going into a real crisis, overproduction of eggs, complete slump in the market, and people started disinvesting. And you saw this, look at this yellow line, this is 2015, and this was mainly your smallholders getting out, getting, having been burnt in um, the overproduction. I, I'm sure a lot of you will remember a tray of eggs was going for under $2 which was not even covering the feed cost. So 2016, it stabilized at a lower level. You can see the 150,000 mark. 2017, wanted to start recovering. And then we had AI, we started picking up. Uh, 20, 20, so sorry, that's, 20, that's 2018. 2017 is my AI here. 2018 is my recovery, 2019, some growth, but then towards the end of the year, some economic instability. And 2020, the big story here was COVID, April and May. People could not access stock. Uh, it was awful, and we were actually, hatcheries were actually gassing chicks. So this was a big hit to this. this yeah, we picked up again, and we had a bit of a slump, and we're picking up again the market for day-old uh, sex pullets is very, very strong. So to put it on an annual basis, um, 2013 to 2020, how many millions? So this is thousands. So we're really going from 1 million to 3.5 million from 2013 to 2020. And you can see 2013, 2014, about 2.3, 2.4 million. I can't see my graph. And you can see in 2015, we shot up to 3 million. Okay. And that was what I was talking about. There was a huge investment, about 50% increase investment, mainly smallholder farmers. We had an overproduction of eggs, and then we saw a disinvestment in 2016. 2017 was compounded by AI. We started seeing a huge growth recovery 2018, 2019, and 2020 was under the influence of COVID. But you can see 2020 still, despite the COVID, stronger than previous years. So this is chicks, chick uh, price in ZWL. The black line, so we, this is just for last year, 2020, January to December, and this is ZWL, you can see at the beginning of the year, chicks were 2000 ZWL per 100 chicks, and we ended up just, we ended up over the 10,000 mark. But what's interesting is when we look at the parallel rate and we put that in US terms, you can see for the most of the year from January to July, it was at $60, per 100 chicks, which is relatively cheap. $60 is normally your broiler price, um, and your, your layer sex pullets were normally 80, 85. So you can see the industry was struggling to make returns. 
and then right-sized uh, towards the end of the year. And we ended up with the year uh, just over $90 per 100 chicks. The demand is firm and a lot of people are not able to pick up their stocks. So shifting now, now we're going on to egg production. And this is the large scale egg production. This is actual returns. So we're going from 2015 to 2020. And, um, uh, and this is the number of birds on the ground going from uh, zero to 1.4 million. And you can see the layer stocks, the ones that, so the green line are these, these are the young birds uh, that the, the uh, layer producers have purchased. Uh, this is the green line and you can see it's hovering around the 300,000 mark. Uh, and this, these are the, the blue line is the actual birds in lay. These are the birds that are giving us the table eggs. And the yellow line is the total, okay? So we were hovering around 900,000 birds in lay. And then AI hit and you can see it hit the one producer and we lost more than half of our large scale commercial layers. And the other point I've made, it took us over a year to rebuild that. And it is now back and it's slightly stronger than your 2015 uh, figures. So if we look at egg production, what has that meant? So this is egg production going from January 2015 to December 2020. And this is table eggs in dozens. So this is going to 800,000 to 2.4 million dozen eggs. And this is of course on a monthly basis. So you can see we went from about 1.5, uh, we increased and we were sitting around an average of around 1.8 million dozen. This is large scale. After AI, we, we lost half and we were sitting at 0.9 million dozen. So obviously we were short 0.9 million dozen going into the industry uh, and that caused a, a major hiccup. But as I've said, you saw in the breeders, you've seen in the stock, a tremendous recovery growth and it's now stabilized at a slightly higher figure than pre-AI. Okay, we've moved, we're averaging around 2 million dozen per month. This is large scale production and this is actual from actual returns. So this now is where we try and estimate what's happening in the smallholder sector. And this is, and the smallholder sector is purely from the number of day old chicks that are going into the market that have not been taken up by the large scale guys sending in returns. So there's a lot of estimation going in here. We try and be on the, on the uh, 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 downside. We don't want to overestimate, but this is obviously a, a, our best estimate. And I'm showing you from 2016, going to December, 2020, and this is your production on your Y axis here going from 0.8 million dozen to 5.3 million dozen. This black line is the one we were looking at just now. Uh, as I told you, we were pretty much around about 1.8 million dozen per month pre-AI. We dropped down to 0.9, we've picked up and we're hovering around the 2 million mark. So looking at the green line, this is the one that's really important. You can see, it, Coming out of 2015, you'll remember that all those chicks, we had a 40%, 50% increase investment into sex pullets, which was mainly going into the, your small and medium producer sector. And we saw a massive increase, uh, 3 million, estimated 3 million chicks versus your 1.8 from your commercial. So total was hovering around 4.8 million dozen per month. And while I'm here, 4.8 million dozen per month equates to one egg per capita per week in Zimbabwe. 
which is very low. It's one of the lowest in the world. So there is tremendous scope to grow egg production. Okay. Um, so we must put that into context. So the green line you can see, remember that the market crashed. Uh, people were getting under $2 a tray of eggs and there was a massive disinvestment uh, in table egg production. And, and of course that hit total egg production. We were sitting around 4.8. We came down to your uh, 3.5 million and then AI, okay? And we don't know what, AI obviously did not affect the SMP, it affected the one producer, um, but you can see what happened in total egg production. All of a sudden we're sitting down around two and a half million from uh, uh, around 4.8. Uh, and as you saw, the large scale showed massive uh, recovery and is sitting around the 2 million mark, higher than pre-AI. And what's, what is interesting to see now, starting in late 2019, going into 2020, some increased investment by the SMPs. And the impact of that is egg production has continued to climb and is breaking the 5 million mark uh, in most of 2020. So just to look at this from another perspective, it's the same graph, I'm just narrowing in. I'm looking at 2019, um, January 2019 to December 2020. Uh, and you can see your large scale has remained pretty constant at 2 million. Your small scale has gone from 2 million up to three and starting to soften. And your total is moved from around 4 million and is sitting around 5 million. The other important thing is this, this dotted line, this green dotted line is the US price and he has the US axis going from $1 per tray to $3 per tray of eggs. And you can see at the beginning of 2019, the market was not good, it was below $2. Uh, things were not looking very good. And then since uh, late in 2019, we've seen a recovery in the price uh, and it's pushed to just below $3, around the $280, $275 a tray mark. Okay, so just looking at egg production year on year, just to give you a feel, so we're going from 2 million dozen per month up to 5.5 million dozen per month. And our previous high was in 2016, that blue line at the top, um, and you can see we were hovering between four and five million a month. Um, we saw 27, uh, 2017 disinvestment from the, the large scale producer. We saw the AI and slump in production. 2018, long term, long starting of growth recovery. 2019, continued recovery. And 2020, our best year to date. So to put that on a, on a year uh, scale, so you can see 2013 to 2015, uh, 45 to 48 million. And as I said, that uh, equates to an egg, a person a week. 2016 was great, but it came with the market crash. So that was the disinvestment. 2017 is the disinvestment of the large scale sector and impact of AI. 2018 is recovery, 2019 continued recovery, and 2020 a record year for this country. And we hope that will continue moving that direction. So what are some of our challenges? And I'm hoping uh, this will be subject for discussion later on, is one, the availability of sex pullets. So it's a difficult market. The sex pullets comes from your breeders. Your breeders are trying to project what's going to happen two years from now. Uh, they, they buy breeders live. They import the parent stock live. Uh, they pay anywhere $150 to $100 per pullet, per breeder pullet. It's a massive investment and it's a two year cycle. So they need to project what's going on two years from now. 
and make sure they are going to be making money from this investment. So you've got that all that uncertainty going into the market there. From the SMP point of view is the availability and cost of point of lay. It is not economically feasible for an SMP to grow to go and buy a hundred uh, bullets and grow them out. It's really much better uh, to have a large scale outgrower who will buy them in batches of a thousand uh, and grow them out. But then the cost of the point of lay to the SMP is prohibitive and it will put him out of pr production. So this is something else that we are looking at. Uh, we are very pleased to be partnering with the EU under the Zimbabwe Agricultural Growth Program. And we do have a project there, the inclusive pork value chain, where we are looking at uh, making point of lay available. So we are working there in five clusters. I hope many of you are already involved in these clusters uh, in Harare, Mutari, Mashvingo, Gweru, and Bulawayo. And then the last challenge and a big one is the distribution and marketing of table eggs. What we are seeing is all the eggs, of, oh sorry, uh, large markets in Bari, for example, so you're getting everybody bringing the eggs to Mbari, all the vendors going to Mbari to collect the eggs and take them out. There's tremendous increased costs in distribution. And this is something else that we're looking at under the IPVC is to try and link the producer to the vendor at the point of production, reducing um, transaction costs, reducing transaction miles, making the product more affordable to the vendor and hopefully more affordable to the uh, consumer. And that is one way we can try and push egg production. I've mentioned it once, let me mention it again. We are consuming one egg per capita per week. Very low, uh, it's one of the lowest in the world. And the egg is one of the most nutritious, it is the most weight for weight, it is the most nutritious a source of protein, and we really need to get that up and going. Um, with that, I want to thank you very much. You can get more information from us on ZPA by writing to admin at lit.co.zw. And I also uh, invite you to visit our website. All the information I've presented today and much, much more is available on our website, www.livestockzimbabwe.com. Thank you. Great highlights there, uh, Dr. Befa. Thank you very much. And it seems we are doing very well, uh, despite the AI outbreak and also the COVID-19 pandemic. We saw the tremendous recovery growth from about 2 million to uh, nearly 5 million dozens a month. This is um, uh, great. And also, we saw that there is great potential uh, for growth. So thank you very much, uh, Doc, for, for the great presentation. Thank so you. Thank you very much. Our next uh, presenter is uh, Tamari Mthangna from POSB. She will cover the financial or financing opportunities in the uh, agricultural sector. Uh, you have 15 minutes, Tamar. Um, thank you, Ro um, Roland. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Tamar Mfana from POSB Agribusiness. Uh, I'll just unpack. Um, the financing opportunities that are available in the agriculture sector. Mostly, I like to focus on um, the eligibility criteria that financial institutions use when considering someone for funding, because um, it goes without saying that um, the major uh, access to finance is a major issue um, in this economy and as such, I will just um, unpack the criteria 
that is generally used by financial institutions and a few other items. Um, Roland, kindly enable my sharing button. I, I, I can't share. Sure, hold on, Tamar. Um, we're sorting it out. Yes, you can proceed. Okay, I can now share. All right, um, thank you. Okay, I hope everyone can see. Yes, we can see your screen now. Okay. Um. So, uh, briefly, I'll just go into the background. Um, where in research does show that there's a direct relationship between um funding and productivity. Um, this implies that um, when access to funding is enhanced for our farmers, the agricultural sector stands a better chance. Stands a better chance um, in terms of unlocking capacities um, and um, diversifying and expanding um, projects. Um, and as such, it goes without saying that there is need to enhance access to funding. Um, the general sources of funding that are available in Zimbabwe, um, they are varied, but not as varied as in other more developed economies. Um, we have our command agriculture, which in 2019 contributed 17%. And then um, we have our contract farming, um, which is becoming a more popular source of funding uh, for our farmers, and which are also referred to when uh, referring to forms of collateral that can be used in, in, in accessing funding for, um, for our farmers. Then we also have bank loans, which only contributed 9%. And this is very disconcerting because banks are supposed to be intermediaries facilitating access to credit. So when you see it contributing just 9%, you know that we have an issue right there. This also speaks to the eligibility criteria that I will be dwelling much on um, as I proceed with my presentation. And then we have self-funding, which is also known as equity, wherein you use your own funds to start your project, to finance your project. This contributes 24%. Um, it's one of, it's about the highest form of funding used in the country. And this is also concerning because um, like I said earlier, banks are supposed to be intermediary sourcing credit and passing it on to the productive sector. And sometimes you'd find that depending on what stage your business is in, there are various stages of the business cycle, equity can become a very expensive form of funding as compared to the use of um, borrowed funds. Then we have the presidential input scheme, um, which contributes about 11%. That's a considerable contribution. Then we have donor funding, which contributes about 8%. Um, I think this donor funding is one of the reasons why bank, um, banks are not so willing to fund agricultural sector. I say this because there's the donor syndrome that then um, scourges, that is a scourge in our agricultural community, wherein um, people are used to free money. And so when they, when they then access bank loans, they're not able to pay back because they have this donor mentality. And I will be, so, and as such, um, we have that um, scourge that, that um, needs to be done away with. And then we have other forms of funding, such as joint ventures, PPPs, and this contribute about 10-7%. So the challenges faced in agricultural funding, the donor dependent syndrome, which I briefly um, referred to, wherein um, farmers do not then feel the need to return uh, funds that they would have borrowed. And this reduces, this increases the risk associated with lending to the agricultural sector. And like I said before, this mentality needs to be done away with um, by means of training, by awareness campaigns to say, when you access funds that should be repaid, you then need to treat your um, product, production activity, such as your egg production as a business, do it properly so that you're then able to honor your principal and interest repayments. Then there's the lack of banking history, lack of acceptable collateral, um, uniqueness of the farming industry, wherein cash flows in the farming industry are different from any other cash flows, for example, in the retail sector. Um, and as such, there's limited um, funding that is structured in the way that the agricultural sector is able to benefit from it. 
um, in terms of the tenure, even in terms of the repayment um, structuring. I will uh, go back to these factors in more detail as I dig deeper into the eligibility criteria as mentioned before. Then um, there's the poor use due to lack of technical um, services. I always encourage farmers to be members of associations. For example, the association, um, the Zimbabwe Poultry Association, so that they have access to information and are able to operate their ventures as businesses. Um, okay. And then um, this is just a table showing the level of financial exclusion um, in, in, in the economy. And this goes to show um, that um, very few people are able to access finance, as I previously alluded to. 70% um, of um, people were shown, this is a FinScope consumer survey um, conducted in 2014. Yeah, it has been a while. I'm sure a lot has changed, but these are the latest figures that I could find. So um, only 30% of people are currently have access to banking services. Um, and then only 58%, um, only about 58% um, of the population of the economy is excluded from accessing credit. So this shows that most people are not able to access funding. And then now the main aspects that I would like um, the participants here to focus on is the eligibility criteria that is used by financial institutions in general, because they tend to be, um, the perception that it is near impossible or very difficult to access finance from financial institutions. So I'm here to just try and demystify that perception. Um, first and foremost, I always um, insist that you need to have a prior relationship with any institution, any banking institution. How do you do this? You do this by way of opening a bank account, for example. And then if you're someone who's making your sales, you're selling your eggs, you can access your POS machine. This even increases convenience given the cash challenges that have always been plaguing our economy. So when you have this relationship with your bank, when you then feel the need to expand your business, you can easily walk into your bank to say, look, I have an account with you that has been operating within reasonable means and kindly support uh, my expansion or kindly support my diversification or whatever you need to have done. It is impossible for you to just walk into a financial institution and say, um, I'm running this and that successfully, please fund me. That is not possible. You need to establish a prior relationship with your institution. And then there's the issue of um, bank a bankable proposal. You need to be able um, to come up with a bankable proposal wherein you share your vision with your banker. This is the only way that you're able to share your vision, that you're able to explain, to say, um, these are my long-term objectives, these are my short-term objectives, and then share in your vision. Therefore, um, your banker can then, or your financial institution can then buy into this vision. And then um, a credit history. This is very important, and this is a factor that I always emphasize to say you need to have some form of a credit history that is that um, your financial institution can then refer to. Um, yes, because if you're just coming out from nowhere and you're looking for funding, um, banks need this um, good credit history. What I mean by this is that when you borrow, for example, even from um, most people, maybe do go and borrow clothing items from um, Edgar's and the like. Make sure that you service these um, obligations well, because when then you approach a financial institution and you want, um, you need uh, funding and you have a trace from a past debt that you did not service properly, it'll work against you. And as such, you need to be responsible. You need to make sure that you maintain a clean credit history um, do not take anything for granted. Then there's the issue of budgets and cash flows. These are very important tools that you need um, when you decide to apply for a facility, because these, these are also important even for you, even before you decide to apply for a facility, because they enable you to see um, the profitability of your enterprises. 
because you might be running at a loss and that is not what you're looking for when you're trying to operate a business you're trying to operate a profitable business and as such when you prepare your budgets you're also able to plan and you're also able able to see how and your goals you're then able to very important because it helps you also to see if you're operating profitably and then your cash flows help you to see exactly how much cash should be coming into your business and be going out from your business this is a reality check even for you and it also helps you um, when you decide to then go approach a financial that you need to be able to pay but, but that you need to have some knowledge of because you can engage a third party to prepare this for you at minimal cost i've collected so many eggs today so many eggs tomorrow documenting each and everything that you're doing to say i have uh, vaccinated i have injected so much my and, and so on so you need to have a traceable rec um, a record this will show that you have done all your processes properly one and two this is also enable you to have records over time to show that you're um you're doing well or you're uh falling short somewhere this is very important um there are also very simple softwares that can enable you to compute simple financials to show your incomes and your costs this is very important because they enable the financial institution also to determine your affordability for the funding that you're looking for and these do not have to be complex they are very simple ones and very simple tools that you can use for that um and then I think we can agree that the issue of collateral, the issue of security is one of the most significant issues, the one of the biggest problems, um, and one of the biggest hindrances to access to finance, especially for agricultural community. Um, why? Because mostly financial institutions prefer immovable security as collateral. But this is becoming a thing of the past. Um, uh, financial institutions are coming with more innovative ways of securitizing these facilities, especially for small farmers who do not have immovable collateral. Um, examples that come to mind are optic agreements. If you're in a contract agree, contract funding agreement with a reputable organization such as Ivan, such as National Foods, you can approach your bank, especially if you have that prior relationship that I alluded that I have alluded to. You can approach your bank to say, look, I have a contract and a sure market, a definite market, and I need funding, and I have my birds on the ground. I need funding to do this, to honor this contract and so forth because one of the biggest issues also in agriculture is the issue of markets to say you have your birds you have your eggs ready now um but the market the, you, you have no market which means you have no one to sell to or and, and so forth and so forth so when you have that definite contract that defined optic agreement you can you um approach your financial institution particularly as if in that prior relationship to say i have this contract to this reputable company fund me because i have a definite market because a bank wants to be able to ring fence it's um it's 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 a um, it's it's uh funding okay and then um also as part of collateral base i always encourage farmers to join associations in line with their production um for example in this case the relevant association would be the zimbabwe poultry association this also helps when there's need um sometimes these associations approach financial institutions um in search of uh, funding it is easier for them to access funding on behalf of the farmers than for the individual farmer to access finance so when you subscribe to these um, associations you have access to information as well you have possible access to funding because it is easier for financial institution to deal with an association than to deal with hundreds of individual farmers so i always recommend that as a farmer have an association that you subscribe to. And then briefly, I'll just go through the types of funding that are available um, for the uh, taking. 
Um, we have equity, which is basically on contribution, um, which I have referred to, which is the biggest, um, the most um, prevalent way that our farmers are funding their businesses. Um, and then we have uh, debt, um, which is uh, funding from banks, from your microfinance institutions. Um, uh, the eligibility criteria for that, which I've explained before. And then the key tenants of debt funding is repayment source. So if financial institutions need to have the certainty of where the repayment for the funding that they would have extended to the farmer will be coming from. Um, if that part is misty or is unclear, then access to funding um, is not impossible. So banks need to have a clearly defined source of repayment. That is why I say that when you have an optic agreement or a contract funding arrangement with a reputable entity, it is easy, it is quite possible for one to access funding because that repayment source is almost certain. And then we have the issue of security. Obviously, um, banks do not want to be left exposed. Financial institutions do not want to be left exposed. So they need that security. They need that collateral, which I've referred to to say. There are various forms of innovative ways of um, that financial institutions are coming up with that are besides the conventional ways of um, uh, securitizing um, your, your, your lending. So you need to be well aware of all of these. And you can also approach your finance. Do not be afraid to walk up to, to walk into a financial institution to find out information about your options. There are sources of information in most financial institutions wherein you have access to information, um, any information that you might um, want regarding funding for the project and any other information. And then um, trust or relationship is very important, is a very important tenet of debt funding. Um, financial institutions need to have that relationship. They need to have that prior relationship. Like I, I explained before, it is near impossible for one to just approach a financial institution from nowhere, from the blue, and um, um, request for funding and um, receive it. So there needs to be that trust that is built over time. So I always recommend, um, which leads up to my last tenet of debt funding, which is to say only borrow for gold. Do not borrow to fund consumption. When you borrow, that is why you need to have your budgets in place to see where your deficit is, to see what um, working capital issues need attending to, or what capital expenditure issues need attending to always only borrow for growth. Um, that is why I always recommend that um, one starts where they are with what they have, because mostly financial institutions are not willing to fund green projects. What I mean by green projects is starting, when you're only starting your project, you have nothing on the ground, and then you decide to borrow. This is not recommended, and financial institutions are not really willing to um, support those types of projects. So start where you are with what you have, and then when you need to grow, approach your financial institution. When you start with what you have, also start nurturing your relationship with the, fi with the financial institution of your choice. And then I always like to close my golden entrepreneurial rule, which says that until you know value, everything is worthless. Thank you so much. Um, those are my content details. You can find me at POSB HQ, fifth floor, because we built it. And that is my email address. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Tamari, for demystifying the eligibility criteria used by financial institutions. And we, we noted that you know a, a prior relationship with the bank is critical, a bankable proposal credit history, also financial projections, traceable records, and the innovative ways on collateral, such as you know, joining the associations, off-tech agreements, and insurance. Many thanks for, for that great presentation. And just a reminder that if, to our audience, that if you have any questions, please share in the chat or in comments um, if you are watching on, on Facebook. Also, 
uh, there are some who are asking for the presentations. Please share your, your, your email addresses in the chat section so that you will be able to receive the, the presentations uh, later on. So as um, um, we move on, our next presenter is Obey Mashinga. He is with National Foods. He is going to cover on nutrition and feeding in the next uh, 20 minutes, Obey Mashinga. I'm Obey Mashinga uh, from National Foods. I'm going to present on nutrition and feeding on layers and its contribution to the business of egg production. So I'm trying to, for full screen view here. Yeah. So it's, I think it's, it's not visible. So um, just to start with um, the introduction, uh, we are national foods and uh, we are the, num the number one feed for every breed. So basically we are there to provide with good quality feed for our layers that maximize uh, egg production and enhance the business of egg production. So uh, egg production and egg show quality are basically important indicators to evaluate production performance of laying hands and economic efficiencies. So uh, this we've got uh, impact is uh, the, the, the show, especially the egg show quality is the one which determines um, the eggs that are available for sale. So we don't want eggs with uh, weak shells and the eggs that result in a lot of breakages. So this results in uh, losses to the farmer. So basically our diet should be in such a way that it allows uh, good formation of egg shells and uh, enhance egg production so that the business becomes uh, profitable. So eggshell quality is mainly driven by desert minerals, that is calcium and phosphorus. So uh, the feed mainly supplies calcium that is needed for formation and of these uh, eggshells. So and egg production as well is mainly driven by protein and energy in the diet. So this determines the number of eggs produced and as well the size and weight of the eggs produced. So our layer beds, uh, on average, they start laying at the age of 18 weeks of age up until to around 18 weeks of age. So uh, data requirements of the laying beds vary throughout their growth stages and their production. So depending with, the, with their physiological uh, stage in production, uh, this determines as well requirements of, for, for their diet requirements, their nutri nutrients that are required for that particular project production stage. So beds uh, are started off on feed that allows them to grow and develop internal organs. So basically for our layer beds, we need uh, proper development of the internal organs, uh, especially on the uh, rep reproductive organs. So we've got basically two types of feeds. That is uh, our rearing diets, and our layer diets. So um, on layer rearing, that is from day old, uh, that's where we introduce our layer rearing diets. So this diet allows for optimum development of all internal organs, that is reproductive organs, which are very important in the layer bed. And as well, they allow slow growth rate as opposed to prelance. So on, on layer beds, uh, we need to synchronize growth rates and uh, development of the internal organs so that uh, when the beds reach uh, sexual maturity for egg production, they will, the, 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 the internal organs will be well developed. So slow growth rate encourages internal organ development, uh, good skeletal growth and development, and as, as well, uh, development of the sexual organ. organ. And uh, layer rearing diet ensures targeted body weight at point of laying. So body weight is a contributes on um, on egg production. That is, if we have achieved our targeted body weight at point of laying. So uh, our layer rearing feeds uh, from day zero. We start on chick starter mesh. 
So this feed is fed uh, at lip jam to later base from placement to approximately uh, six weeks of age. So at lip jam feeding is just basically a limited supply of feed. So during this period, uh, each bed should consume approximately 1.1 kg of feed uh, during this period. So from chick starter mesh, uh, that's when we move on to introduce grower's mesh. So grower's mesh is basically introduced around the age of seven weeks. So it is during this time that is the, there is need for care to mix the grower feed with the chick uh, mesh for the to allow smooth transition so this smooth transition allows transition from a standardized to grower diet so that we don't want to, to stress the beds and as well it is important during this period that we, we allow uh, enough feed intake so that uh, our beds grow and as well develop um as i mentioned before so this feed uh, is all well, the grass mesh is fed at lip jump to layer type beds from seven weeks of age up until to 18 weeks of age, where we expect that our beds would have reached a point of laying. So during this time, our beds are expected to consume approximately 4.9 kgs of feed during this period. That is from seven weeks of age to 18 weeks of age. So from our rearing days, we fed our beds to point of laying that's where we now we move on to our layer feeds. So our layer feeds uh, range involves feeding of layers with different diets at different times that consist of varying nutrient density corresponding to different phase of production. So basically, as we start from point of laying, we move on to, uh, to peak laying, and as, well, as time goes, our beds uh, will start to reduce egg production that's when we move on to the end of the laying cycle. So our feeds are catered to, to cater for all different stages of production. So nutritional requirements vary, vary with the physiological stage of laying, and laying hens require high, high amounts of calcium for egg shells. So as I mentioned before, the, the most uh, important nutrient during this stage is calcium, which is, uh, which is available for the formation of eggshells, strong eggshells, and you will minimize breakages and uh, production of soft shells. So laying, laying meshes typically contain uh, around 3.7% to 3.9% calcium. And calcium is basically supplied from limestone flour and limestone grease. So we include limestone grease in our diet so that uh, we allow sl slow release of calcium to our animals, which is needed uh, with, well, with our beds. So this table uh, basically summarizes our layer feed range. So we've got three types. We've got early lay feed, mid lay, late lay feed. So early lay is introduced to the beds uh, from onset of laying, that is point of lay, to around 20 weeks. So basically, the nutritional composition, uh, this feed contains about 15% uh, crude protein, and calcium is around 3.7%, uh, and energy is around 11.5% uh, megajoules per kg. And uh, as we move to mid lay, uh, protein content seems to, to reduce to about 4.5%, and our calcium is increasing a bit to about 3.8, and energy around uh, it's 11.4 megajoules per kg. And lay and uh, early lay, mid lay is fed from uh, about four, 40 weeks of age to 60 weeks of age. And late lay, uh, which is fed from 60 weeks of age until culling of the beds, which provide around 14% protein and with relatively higher calcium percent of about 3.9%. So this feed, as I mentioned before, they are made in such a way that at each stage, they provide nutritional requirements that suit uh, uh, that point of production. So that is from our early lay to peak production, the mid lay phase, and to late lay phase. So that is basically the summary of our layer feed range. So we've got option for uh, layers concentrate. So this is basically for our farmers that have got uh, abundant supply of maize. So it's, that's where when you 
uh, you have to miss two parts of our layers concentrate to three parts of maize by mass. So this this result in feed is uh, the normal layers mesh. So this feed is well provide uh, nutrients that are required by our beds for production of eggs. So expected consumption is around 115 to 150 grams per bed, depending on bed, breed, type, and environment. So, uh, yeah, in saying all this, uh, it is important to feed our beds with uh, re relevant and necessary uh, nutrients so that we maximize our production. So, in the event that our base didn't get enough nutrients, didn't get in a, a diet that is not well balanced in terms of nutrients that are required for laying, we've got problems that uh, we, that we can have so that in, as well reduce our egg production and as well have a negative impact to the business. So we've got issue of egg soft shells. I mentioned this before, and this is basically uh, on the issue of lack of calcium in the diet. So that's where we, we observe our beds um, laying eggs that have got soft shells and they, they can easily uh, lead to breakages and to, to losses. And as well, uh, on, on that issue, we can have issues of cannibalism. So this is basically a lack of sodium in the diet where we can notice uh, issues of cannibalism in our beds. And as well, uh, we can leave, we can have issues in reducing egg production. So our production is measured basically on the number of eggs produced, uh, the size of eggs, and uh, weight of the eggs. So if our beds uh, got a, a diet that is non that does not provide necessary or relevant nutrients that are required, we have issues of uh, reduced numbers, uh, reduced egg size, reduced egg egg weight. So basically this in a negative way affect our business. So we as national food, we are there to provide feed that is well balanced to provide all these necessary nutrients that are required for lay, laying of eggs and the, to the business of egg production. So we also have an issue of fat liver syndrome. So this basically uh, happens at the end of the laying cycle where uh, lower egg production results in lower eggs uh, in lower energy requirements. So excessive carbohydrates uh, are converted into, into fat. So the, this accumulates on the liver. So this, this as well have impact on egg production and as well leads to reduced egg production. And in some extreme cases can lead to mortalities. So it is a, a negative impact to, to, to the business. So as well, our feed are made in such a way that they cater at each and every stage of production so that we minimize all these problems that can negatively impact on our beds. So I think uh, with this, I thank you all. Thank you very much, Obey, for such uh, a great presentation. Uh, for sure, nutrition is really key to the success of our egg production businesses. And uh, poor nutrition, we noted that it results in low egg pro uh, production, cannibalism, fatty liver syndrome, and also soft egg shells. So farmers, if you are facing these challenges, you need to uh, get in touch with uh, Obey. Uh, he will assist you on, on, on uh, the solutions to these nutritional issues. So as we move on, our next presenter is Dr. Garikai. Maruzi is with uh, Pro Pharma. Uh, he's going to cover the issues to do with uh, health and layer management. Uh, Dr. Maruzi, you can go for it. All right. Um, all right. Um, before I progress, I would love to greet uh, everyone once again. My name is Karika Maruzi. I'm the resident veterinarian for Profits. Uh, I would love to introduce um, Pro Pharma uh, to most of uh, us here, because I, I can see some will be wondering where, uh, where, where is Pro Pharma coming in or where is it coming from? 
so basically, uh, Pro Pharma um, is a retail platform for profits, private limited. And uh, I'm sure all of us uh, know profits as a manufacturer of uh, livestock feed in Zimbabwe and one of the leading uh, manufacturers. Uh, so Pro Pharma is, uh, is, is the retail footprint for profits private limited and it has over 45 branches nationwide. And our network, our branch network uh, now provides uh, more products and improved shopping experience under the Pro Pharma app and uh, Pro Pharma Express concept stores. So the, prom, the Pro Pharma brand uh, encapsulates our traditional array of products which we now uh, range from agricultural inputs uh, such as seed, fertilizer, crop chemicals to a comprehensive assortment of veterinary products and solutions uh, <coughs> for poultry and um, other um, uh, uh, livestock. So as of today, I've been requested to um, give um, a presentation on uh, health issues um, and, and that's um, what I'll be uh, doing as of now. So today I'll present on layer health issues and um, it's, a, it's a mixed bag really. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad uh, my predecessors, they managed to, 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 to show or ask the way in, a, in, a, in a different ways. But I'll try to tackle the issue also in a, in a different way. Uh, manner. <clears throat> so I would, uh, I've decided to, to focus uh, from the uh, uh, rearing stage that's from chicks uh, to pullets until they get to point of lay and as we go on. So basically what we need to really understand is um, the way we are going to rear our chicks or our layer chicks or our pullets would impact uh, in a different way or different ways to how they are going to uh, perform by the end of uh, uh, the growout period. So we really encourage that uh, is what uh, Obey was saying, um, th there's really need for us to ensure that we, we, we give the best opportunity, uh, which is in terms of feed and, 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 and the brooding conditions to ensure we have a flock that is uniform. So the greatest challenge is if we do not have a uniform uh, flock, a flock that is uniform we will run into a number of issues. I've said it to start with flock uniformity because it is the root cause of many of the health issues that we face. So when you are having a flock that is not uniform, by right, uh, uniformity or poor uniformity, I'm, I'm referring to uneven sizes within a flock. It just denotes that we are having unfair competition within the flock. So what we really need is to have the best uniformity as possible, always. Because the moment we have uh, unfair competition within the house, it means those birds will not feed, drink, or even uh, 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 behave the same within the house. There are certain behaviors that will be exhibited, certain habits that will be exhibited, which most of the time we may not be interested in. So, if I'm going to take, for example, infectious uh, basal disease infection, which is uh, quite known by most as IBD. With such an infection, if uh, it comes, uh, we get to have IBD infections within, uh, 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 within flocks. We have these uh, infections when, when we, we, we have overlooked uh, some aspects in terms of our production. So we're going to notice that if you are going to, for example, let's say vaccinate a flock, vaccination of a flock, which is poor uniformity, means that not all the beds are going to take an adequate dose of the vaccine. So by end of the day, we are going to end up having uh, some beds taking the vaccine through uh, other means, and this would result in infection. So it's really key that even as you progress, and we know with layer chicks or uh, pullets, they are going to have a number of, of vaccinations that are going to, 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 to be given to them. It's good that you ensure that, especially the mass vaccinations that are to do with uh, water vaccination, 
you need to ensure the uniformity is as best as possible because all the small beds they will take less uh, less less amount less amount of the dose or not at all so you need all beds to have an adequate dose for them to have protective immunity so another view that you would love even to 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 use in explaining how IBD infections come or result in a, layer, in a layer flow is you need to give adequate vaccination water, vaccine water that you are giving the flow when you are doing a, a, a mass water vaccination. Why is this so? It is because if you if you note that your beds are going to consume less than uh, all the water in less than one and a half hours, then it means that again some have not taken enough. So, giving amount of water, the best way to ensure that you give the adequate amount of water is to make sure you you, you do a pre-test or pre-run of the vaccination a day or two before the actual day of vaccination. This will give you the best uh, approximate amount of water which is needed for the vaccination process. So this will allow uh, all the beds to take adequate amount of water. Another issue to note when we are around IBD infection is we need to ensure that uh, <clears throat> we test the beds in at least for at least one and a half hours or one hour, depending on our the condition. If it's very hot, then it's good to use the one hour test period. And if uh, in the winter or cold times, we use the, 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 the one and a half hours for testing the beds. This affects the competition of the beds in drinking the vaccine water. The moment you forget about these dynamics when you're doing vaccination, it usually leads to a, a IBD outbreaks within a flow. And the last thing that we also need to really uh, uh, look at is um, the history of IBD uh, uh, on a site. So this will help you, this will help, help you to understand or to know that um, which vaccine or vaccine should I use? So you need, this is where we, we, we continue to recommend uh, farmers uh, to know that, uh, to, to, to remember that uh, recording or the issue of records is quite key when it comes to, to how you manage your flocks. So another uh, disease that's most common in uh, different layers is to do with uh, coccidiosis. Coccidiosis is a disease that is caused by protozoa. And uh, for your own information, almost all poultry rearing sites, they have uh, these parasites that cause coccidia. But the good thing that we need to really understand is um, the coccidia do not cause a disease until they are given certain conditions. So there is a head of they need to, to, to jump or skip here. So, the best way to prevent issues to do with coccidiosis is to ensure that we manage our litter in the best way ever. So they require moist, uh, uh, hot conditions or warm conditions so that the, the parasites, they change from a non-infectious state to an infectious state. Such that when the birds take in those parasites, then they can, uh, disease can ensure. So you really need understand that. And there is another issue that most farmers tend to mix up with coccidiosis. Coccidiosis, uh, what you see is the bloody diarrhea that you see um, when the beds are uh, 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 passing out their, their droppings, their fecal droppings for that matter. So you really need to separate pested vents or pesting vents and coccidiosis. So I, I've seen a lot of farmers, uh, they get into a panic and uh, while it's the bed they're improving and tend to rush and look for medicines. There is no need to look for medicines while it's your first first uh, uh, um, vents. Because first vents basically they are an indication that the temperatures within the uh, the port house is fluctuating. It's going up, way up and also down. So there is a really need for us to really separate uh, some of these issues so that we, we do not uh, 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 tend to overuse uh, uh, antibiotics in the home. 
And uh, there's another aspect uh, that I've seen also during rearing that troubles a lot of farmers, and this is to do with the vaccine reaction. So when I'm talking about vaccine relation, I am talking of uh, 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 the negative effects that come or the adverse effects that come with the use of the vaccine. So most of the time with vaccines, you really need to understand uh, that they are alive, some of them, they are alive. And depending on, 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 on how uh, aggressive they are, uh, in course, uh, you tend to have disease, especially if you do not follow manufacturers' uh, instructions. For example, I will give you uh, ILT vaccine. We usually run into uh, issues, a lot of issues. A lot of farmers, they call us and uh, try to point out the issues to do with the uh, eye irritations, etc. These, they come if you are going to use these vaccines uh, two weeks uh, after or uh, two weeks uh, 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 before uh, using uh, use of, of respiratory vaccines, other different respiratory vaccines. So we really need to understand the type of vaccine that we are using, when to use it, and other vaccines that we are using uh, 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 within the vaccination program. So it's very key that we, we understand these dynamics. It helps us a lot in terms of uh, working uh, through our vaccination uh, programs. Another issue is to do with um, the vaccination of sick flocks. We do not vaccinate sick flocks as a rule of thumb. Many farmers, they get into panic mode when they see depressed uh, beds and beds with uh, ruffled feathers. They tend to rush to vet shops and would love to, to get uh, 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 some vaccines to prevent the disease. You don't prevent a disease that's already uh, uh, in progress uh, within your flock. So it's really dangerous and it would lead to issues to do with high mortality as we progress. So there's another issue that we really need also to, 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 to understand is um, we do not uh, vaccinate the same flock using a same vaccine over a large period of time. The moment we do so, there is a danger that the vaccine uh, may end up triggering uh, 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 vaccine-related uh, um, or the disease. For example, it's a, we say it's a, out of interest. We say it's, it's an IVD infection. One one group of the flock has been vaccinated, the other is not. We also have jumping off um, uh, 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 the vaccine. And then now the second thing, it's unfortunate on this one, uh, Rollins, uh, it, it strongly instructed me to, 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 to try to, to, to run away from feed, but I saw that uh, it's, it's one area that uh, we, we are most um, deeply into and I couldn't avoid it. I had to bring in uh, some of the related health issues that emanate from feed. And uh, with these uh, issues, the first question that I would um, want us as farmers to ask ourselves is uh, what, uh, what type of feed, what are we feeding our birds? And this question um, would trigger a cascade of, of, of thoughts as we progress. You will find that we have been blessed this year. We have a lot of, uh, um, um, there are telltale signs that we have a lot of, um, a, a, a good raw material supply uh, from the fields. And uh, in the blessing, we seem also to have the rains and the rains, they don't even seem to indicate that they are going to slow down or stop anytime. So what we need to understand as farmers is we need to really understand that the way we are going to have this, the way we are going to store, and the way we are going to prepare uh, our raw rows is going to affect the quality of the feed that you are giving these birds. So even if you are going to check uh, on the side photo here, we are going to see this is feed that has been stored. These are marsh feed for the layers, but you find some farmers are feeding this type of uh, layer feed to, to our beds. So we will have issues um, because feed with frost will uh, basically um, put off the beds if they are chicks or any of the beds in production, they will go off 
of, of PIB. The appetite goes low, and even you start experiencing uh, weight problems, you start experiencing also um, issues to do with um, uh, production. So please be careful now you're going to store and prepare your feed, ensure the rows are dry. Uh, if they become moldy, then you're going to have a lot of mycotoxins. They will get also in the human chain. And uh, even on the bedside, they cause again fluctuating uh, production uh, patterns. And also we tend to have feeding issues as the beds will be having uh, some oral ulcers. There's a question which I thought uh, can take us into uh, a, a, a journey, uh, the, the experiences of many. And this question is to do with um, a situation where we are having good pullets and uh, then uh, these good pullets, they're having a low peak production. When we have such six scenarios, what we need to really ask ourselves is, uh, are we picking all the eggs? Are we picking adequate eggs? The reason being is uh, most of the time, the moment you experience such uh, uh, issues, we may be having a high margin of flow eggs than we think. And the greatest danger of flow eggs is most of the time they ultimately end as manure. Either they have broken and sunk into the litter or they've been taken by the beds because they've been broken, they get, get eaten. And again, we end up having them as manure. So you may not even see it. So when we are faced with big bullets with a low production, it's quite key that you really uh, uh, use your records to really try to identify if you are having a, a, a higher margin percentage of low eggs or not. So there's a situation again where sometimes you may say, fine, I do not have a high percentage of low eggs than, than, than we think. So the moment you face such a scenario, then you need to refocus and check on the amount of feed that you are giving, check on the amount of feeding programs that you are giving. And the question of uniformity that I had tried to introduce earlier uh, on also comes into play. So if you are having a flock with poor uniformity, you find that the, the window period in which they come into lay becomes longer. They take time, a longer time again to get to peak. This is because not all beds are feeding at the same level. The strong beds, they feed first and always they take much of the feed and they're the beds which are feeding you um, the eggs. And those beds which are underweight and taking a, a little amount of feed, they just take along. So it's really possible for farmers to get up to sometimes a, a half a year even plus with a bed that's just taking along. So we really need to uh, uh, use our records as tools so that we can end up uh, uh, um, uh, improving our performance. Another issue that I thought uh, of is necessary is if you're going to check on this photo that I have uh, posted here, you're going to check that we are having a, a, a layer house, right? These are beds that we're in lay. Uh, but if you check the arrangement of, of uh, the scenario, the picture that's within uh, this house, it's quite a disheartening. Uh, picture. Look at it this way. You, are, you can find that we are having feeders. And with this feeder, if you can check, there is no base with this feed. In other uh, feeders, you will find that they, they do not even contain the feed. And if you can check some of the drinkers, they don't even have the water. So these basics that we have, in they are under management. As long as we do not up our management style, then we end up triggering a cascade of events that would present, present in combination or singly, and we are going to have, end up having problems. So if you're going to check again uh, here right at the end, these points uh, that I have highlighted with arrows, these are areas that should be uh, used as the next process. So farmers, what we really need to understand here you and me, we can agree to use a bathroom as a bathroom. We can agree to use a kitchen as a kitchen. But with beds, they, we do not have the privilege to communicate that uh, without placing good uh, conditions. So they only follow, they only uh, cooperate when they are, they, they, they are approximate or the best conditions uh, suiting a particular uh, uh, situation. So in this, Area, you find most of the beds they do not lay in these sections that have been laid as uh, nest uh, boxes. So, roughly to take uh, out of here, uh, a, a 
uh, nest boxes should be um, a box which may measure roughly 35 uh, by 35 by 45 centimeters and should be isolated, should be in a quiet space, should be at least a bit dim, should not have the same lighting as uh, the whole house. This helps a lot in terms of uh, uh, giving the, 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 um, the environment which is serene that would allow um, the birds to feed. So most farmers, if you can check here, we can have also feed the uh, feeding equipment which is in front of the nest. This should not be done. It causes a lot of problem as we improve or increase activity uh, near the nest boxes, it will lead to a lot of egg breakage. And we tend to have even a, a, a lot of low as birds concentration will be uh, affected now and again. So it's really key that we up our management to uh, prevent issues to do with the uh, flow eggs, egg eating, bent pecking, and even reproductive infections. Uh, so many times we've uh, met farmers, they visit our shops, and the first thing they highlight is, ah, my bed has had an egg that broke inside its abdomen. I mean, how do you understand or how do you think that egg broke inside? It's not really an egg that broke inside, but when we have reproductive infections, uh, that come through the project movement of antibacteria in the reproductive tract, we end up having issues to, 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 to do with uh, infections that uh, affect the reproductive tract. And when we have such a reproductive uh, tract infection, they affect the movement of over from the ovary to, 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 to the uh, vent. So most of the time we end up having inlay uh, of or laying of, 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 of uh, internal laying of the yolk into the abdomen. And this yolk is important. Um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, is, 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 is favorite food for bacteria. And the bacteria, when they take it, we end up with all the funny uh, uh, infections that we have even uh, in the abdomen. So management, has a big role to play when it comes to preventing um, a, a, a health issues in layers. So as I'm rounding up, there are issues that I just thought they should not be left uh, behind. And these issues are to do with stressors. A lot of times uh, farmers, they look at you as if you're going nuts when you talk or, or highlight that he's a stressor within a poultry. So basically, let me start by defining what a, 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 a stressor is. A stressor basically is anything, any activities or any, anything that happens uh, uh, within a port house or surrounding port house that leads to a change in, in, in uh, uh, the uh, flock behavior or the bed behavior, right? So you will find most of the time the behavior tends to be more on the negative side. The birds will start exhibiting negative uh, behavior. So basically, examples of stressors that you can find, you can have overcrowding, lack of feed, water. So for example, if I'm going to take you to this side photo here, so that is being held by my sister here, we're having now the bed is no longer it's devoid of a, of, a, of a vent and also internal uh, abdominal contents. These are total signs that we are having um, a stressor within, within, within a flow. So it's quite key that we investigate. And in our investigation as farmers, let's try to be honest and start with the basics uh, and tick all the boxes to ensure that we uh, pass through that box. For example, if I'm going to take you to this uh, bottom uh, photo, that is to my left, you will find that this is where our layers have been placed. And imagine the distance between uh, 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 the beds and the, and the roof here. And Southern Africa in general, it's just hot. Go anywhere, you experience high temperatures. So these high temperatures, they end up uh, in stressing the beds. And by the end of the day, this affects appetite, the way they feed, in turn affecting production. This again causes high irritation as the, uh, the temperature within these houses go up as if it was not enough with this farmer. You can see that even right around the house, there is a black, black plastic uh, sheet. So this 
systems are going to affect even lighting, and the lighting affects the PGM, and the lighting again within the house affect uh, 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 the light that uh, gets to some of the beds that are deep at the bed there. So at the end of the day, it's light that we require for the uh, laying process ultimately and the feed that would build the egg and boom, we have our egg. So stressors, stressors are always found and it is these little things that we may think they are not important, but they end up uh, affecting our flocks uh, negatively. So please always remember any stressor or most stressors, they affect feeding habits, they affect the behavior which the birds exhibit, they may fight, they may pick, they may even eat the eggs. So as we round up, it is key for our farmers or for us farmers to always ask our, ourselves a funny question, why are you into uh, layer beds? Why do you keep layer beds? And then why do you still think, even after this uh, um, session, why do you still like or think you should keep uh, layer beds? If layers are still the best option, then boom, we are very happy. Uh, visit uh, any of our pro farmer stores, or profit stores, pro farmer uh, hub or express, we will always be happy to uh, engage you and uh, help you in your journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Maruzzi, for your great presentation. Thank you. And also, you know, for, for highlighting the good management practices. Our Presenter on economics of production is just sent us uh, apologies, uh, but we do hope to hope to 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 watch them in the next coming few days. So we'll share a recording in our on our uh, agribusiness media platforms. So we now go into the question and answer session, where we have um, a number of questions that we have received from uh, the participants. And the first question is on feed. How much should I feed my layers daily? Maybe obey. Um, you can take that one. Hi, Rollins. Can you hear me? Yes, obey. We can hear you. The question uh, from one of the farmers is how much feed? Uh, should I feed per, per day? Okay, so basically, uh, on the on our uh, for the starter feeds and the grow feed, basically, is at limited I'm supply to the to, to the beds. So it's just unlimited supply. So the beds uh, feed to to satisfy their requirements and their additional requirements. But basically, for the uh, Layer base, they consume at approximately 120 grams feet per day. I'm sure I've answered that one. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Then another one, uh, whilst you're still there, is please can we have a base or national foods contact? Okay, so they can get me on my, my email, which is uh, obey dot machine uh, capital letter O. It's not food.co.zw. And uh, on my phone number, it's also 979 I will repeat email address it's obey.machinga at not food.co.zw uh, with capital letter O. And phone number is 079 Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Obey, for responding to those questions. Then another one here is uh, directed to Dr. Maruzzi. He's saying, Dr. Maruzzi, thank you very much for your great presentation. Um, then um, I'm having a cannibalism problem. What's the solution? 
Okay, thank you very much for the question. Uh, right, when, when you are faced with cannibalism, the best things, uh, the best boxes to take is to make sure, as Obey is saying, tick on the feed uh, box. Do you, do you give the birds adequate amounts of feed? Was as uh, Obey is as alluded to earlier on, on saying, give them uh, 120 grams uh, per bed per day. This is feed taken by the bed not feed that you just added into the container or, or, or into the feeder. So the key thing is to make sure all the basic, basics are there. Did you add adequate feeding? That's the first thing. So in this regard, you need to also to check um, uh, your feed management. Is there no wastage uh, in terms of uh, uh, your feed? If you're having high levels of, of feed wastage, then it means some of the feed is being thrown around and it's not being taken by the bed. Hence, we end up having some beds um, not having uh, adequate uh, satiety because they, 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 they are hungry. And another issue is to do now with the nest boxes. The ideal uh, ratio of uh, nest boxes to hens is in the ratio of at least one nest box for four to five uh, beds, right? So what really happens, the dynamics that happens when a bed is laying is part of the productive system comes out and it's a bit pink or pinkish red, right? So if the beds are overcrowding within nest, right, then you tend to have some beds that will see that pinkish uh, part coming out, pecking on the vent. That's how you end up having beds without vents and intestines. So the key thing is to get into your uh, uh, poultry house, check on the, on the nest. So when I'm talking of favorite nests, I'm highlighting those nests where you frequently collect uh, eggs. You may find that you have 10, 10 nests within a house, but about three are being used. So those three would be the favorite nest. So the conditions that are surrounding or that are being shown This is the best way to ensure you copy the conditions on the other uh, areas. This would reduce cannibalism a, a whole great uh, a lot. That's, that's the, one of the uh, two ways. In the bad behavior that's coming as a result of stress. But from that point now, when beds get into a habit of pecking each other, it becomes a cemented behavior, which is a vice now, a bad behavior. So do all your checks, is feed adequate, nest boxes adequate, stocking density. So another issue is if you checked on the presentation that I made on the lower left, the, 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 the picture that was having beds in that cage, you find that you may be, try to fool yourself and say, uh, no, my stock intensity is okay. Yeah, but if you now look at the situation and see those birds had no nest, they just um, put their eggs anyway. So the high chance of them pecking each other. If you check again, you'll find that uh, those birds, they do not have enough, enough space because when equipment is placed now with those, uh, within those areas, then again, we are having uh, uh, issues to do with uh, reduction in the aspects. So just check around to see these basics if they are in and also any other vices, if there are any other stressors, if, if they are also uh, uh, absent. Yeah, thank you for, thank for you. responding thank to that you. question, uh, Dr. Maruti. We also have um, Mr. Okay, Mishek Ugaro, your hand is up. Yeah, yes, um, facilitator, thank you very much. Um, I had though put the question, but I, I had put the question in the chat, but I can just put it, uh, I can read it. Uh, thanks for the presentations, Dr. Beff. I think it's impressive and everybody else. Ms. Mshanga, I, I wanted to get your views on the banking uh, sector here in Zimbabwe and in particular yourselves. Do you have the impression that you are adequately structured to finance some of us SMEs? Um, because from your presentation, it's obvious uh, many do not qualify 
for example, they would not have a credit history because we have self-funded, so we've never, so that would not uh, score us any marks. Um, but we might have a, a bank account, but I think you are aware currently many do actually not bank, do not bank because they are selling in US dollars and uh, they're just uh, keeping the cash at, at their homes because of the, 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 the situation in the country. So I don't think that the, the banks are adequately um, initiated or initiative enough to take care of the SMEs. We know that economically the SMEs are the sector where they, which deliver growth. Dr. Beff already proved that uh, the SMEs are producing more than the big or the large scale farmers. So I, I think in mine is a suggestion to say you need to review those uh, requirements for, in particular, yours, but generally the banking sector. That's why it's not surprising that they are not funding because they are actually not being innovative. That is my view, but I would appreciate your comment on that. Okay, all right. Thank you for for that comment. Um, uh, Tamar Mthanga, would you like to to respond? or maybe to comment? Um, yes, um, I would like to comment on that. Um, I think um, we agree on those points that um, banks um, in particular in um, this country are not really um, in a position to support the small guys as you, um, the small holders, for example. However, um, there is more and more realization of that fact and the fact that the SMEs are the ones that are actually hoisting this economy up and as such there is a need to be more innovative as um, you've correctly said, um, sir. Um, as you're well aware, uh, most banks have since come up with um, SME banking division. They have since come up with um, SME departments that cater for the needs of these SMEs. Um, this eligibility criteria that I just unpicked is extremely generic. Um, I think you'd see that I dwelt so much on the hindrances, the biggest of which I think for me in my day-to-day -day experience dealing with these smallholder farmers um, and these SMEs is the issue of collateral. Uh, you'd find that um, most banks are trying to uh, mitigate that challenge by coming up with more innovative ways of um, uh, of securitizing um, uh, of securitizing these facilities, um, and that's why I say that um, farmers and SMEs are always welcome to visit these um, SME departments because they have a lot of information. Obviously, the status quo or that is in the open or that is in the public is that banks are not um, in a position to lend this small guys. But this is, I would confidently say that this is evolving. Banks are, uh, are realizing that there's a need to come up with more innovative ways of supporting these guys who are the ones that are actually bankrolling our economy. Um, so if you visit particularly our SME department and find out what offerings we have for the SMEs, especially re in, with respect to the issues of um, collateral, which are really um, the biggest concern. Then um, you talk of credit history. Um, credit history, like I said, it's a generic criteria, eligibility criteria. By credit history, as I might have explained as well, uh, I mean, even when you borrow, even from your TV sales and higher from your Edgar's ETC, most of our small guys tend to neglect those kinds of um, uh, those kinds of issues. For example, they do not service these obligations properly, and when they then come, uh, when they then look to join the mainstream financial sector, this pops up because we do our checks, um, our credit checks. So um, by highlighting credit history, I mean to bring attention to the need to honor your obligations, however small, uh, so that you do not have this um, uh, negative credit history that is popping up. If you do not have a credit history at all, I think a zero credit history for an SME is as good as a good is, is just as good as a good credit history in that it shows that you have no obligations. You've started your own thing on your own. You funded using equity, and as such, um, uh, that's a responsible SME that is in this country. Obviously, in other countries, the credit history is actually a 
really key issue where in there needs to be that history. So we're in agreement in a lot, we are in agreement in a lot of things. There are also hubs that are coming up, incubation hubs um, that banks are coming up with to also nurture these small um uh, these SMEs, these smallholder farmers to um, make them aware of what they need to do so that they also fit into the um, formal financial system. But I think we're evolving slowly but surely. Um, I think we're getting there. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tamari, for the comments and responding to uh, that question. Then another question that we have, I think it's for Dr. Maruti. It's my layers are 20 weeks and are not laying any eggs. What could be the problem? Okay, thank you very much. Right, uh, right. The issue to do with uh, bed laying, yes, to do, it's not only about age. Farmers need to get it right. It's not only about age when you are talking of beds getting into lay. So the first thing that we look at when we have our uh, layers is to ensure that by the time they get to a round point of lay, which is 18 weeks, we should have at least uh, uh, 1450 okay. grams, right? 1450 grams of the beds. And then from that uh, issue, we, 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 we also go to the issue on how we are going to take the beds and uh, custom them into their new environment. Well, the stressing environment, as I was highlighting uh, on the stressors, it tends to affect how these beds are feeding. So each time the beds reduce the amount of feed they take, the, the ovaries or the, the, the over in ovaries, they, 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 they sort of regress, they become smaller and you need again to build that momentum when uh, feed supplies are uh, uh, restored. So it's to do with the age, are they 18 weeks? Yes, uh, in terms of the weight, if they at least go to around 1400, 1450 grams, yes, then you take on if the beds have accustomed themselves to the environment. And the third thing is, if you are going to maintain their good and normal food supplies and they're taking them well, this is the only way that would uh, uh, help you get eggs earlier on. So now to your question now, as to my eggs, my, my, my beds are not uh, uh, laying in their 20 weeks. So the key thing is to ensure that you check amount of feed that you're giving. Are you giving the correct amount of feed as per manufacturer recommendation? Are you not having too much wasted feed? Uh, are your beds uniform and having the, the correct weight? And then the other issue is to do with light. So is the place where the beds are, is it well lit? So in general, we would recommend that you have a, an area or a house that is well lit. We should not have an area that is a, a not, not, not well lit. It will affect how your bed uh, come into lay. Mind you, these days we're having sometimes overcast conditions and these uh, conditions, they tend to affect the light intensity, they tend to affect again the day length. So when the beds are, or should be getting into production when they are in production, day length and light intensity, amount of feed taken, and any, uh, they, they, they tend to affect uh, our beds, how they lay. So all those issues they need to, first of all, be. work to narrow on and see as to where the problem would be. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, and uh, just a follow-up question there yes. from, okay, it's from Mishek. He says, could there be a risk of overweight? Right, so uh, our scale can be a moderator here uh, between you and me and the beds. Uh, you really need the scale now to confirm that uh, are your beds overweight or underweight? So most of the time, you, you may find that the beds would be a bit behind in terms of their weight. So we really need to, the issue to do with overweight. You can just Google on the uh, average, average uh, 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 breed specific uh, uh, performance uh, targets. Then 
you you try to relate as to are we there yet in terms of the weight and then uh, you can also take it up thank you okay doc whilst you're still there again uh, there's another question on depleter versus battery cage uh, they're saying which one is ideal or which one is the best Or when it comes to the best now, it's to do with the space that you have. Uh, it's to do with the space that you have. Because uh, if you have limited space, then it will be good to go for the battery cage system. But if you have the space, sometimes some are, are, are opt for the uh, 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 deep liter system. So basically it's to do with that you have and uh, try to your records also to justify uh, the type of production system that you are getting into. Uh, because I've seen uh, some farmers who also get into using the uh, battery cage system and yet their roofs are quite below. This will affect the whole production system. So if you are going for battery uh, cage system, try to ensure that you have uh, standard structures that would allow uh, conditions to be uh, based within the house because the more you use the battery cage system that means a lot of beds or a high number of beds uh, on a, a very small uh, space so this tends to affect production negatively if we do not have a, a proper uh, structures in place okay thank you very much doc for shedding more light on that one then uh, samsung a50 your end is up Okay, I think the question was addressed. So because of our time, uh, we uh, unfortunately we have to uh, end the meeting now. So we thank you very much for joining this webinar and our presenters, we thank you very much. We had great presentations from the experts in the industry. We have posted a link to our WhatsApp group. So if you're interested, you can join using the link in the comments. So the presenters that we had today were Dr. Baffa, Dr. Befa uh, from the Producers Association, with Tamar Mthanga from the POSB, Obey Mashinga from National Foods, Dr. Maruzi from ProFarm and also Profits. We really appreciate your presentations and we hope to host you in the uh, coming uh, upcoming web webinars. So also the, to the audience, if you're interested in the webinars to come, uh, please join our mailing list so that you receive uh, the updates. So we'll end the meeting in the next minute just to allow you to join um, the WhatsApp groups uh, if, if you are interested. Thank you.